Hey everyone, it's Igor and Ryan here for Philosophy in Motion, our new name for the Project Uproar uh, podcast and YouTube channel. And today I wanted to talk about pretty much finance, how to achieve financial independence, give a different kind of paradigm to the largely fed by society and stuff that helped us, me and Ryan, out with getting better with money and with not making as many stupid mistakes and stuff we would have told our younger selves and that we would have liked to hear in a video earlier on in our lives. Yeah, and I was just telling Igor that this period of time where we've been socially isolating has really gotten my, uh, me to reflect more on finances, the stuff I spent before that now I could possibly change when this whole situation ends. So I've definitely been thinking more about finance. I know yourself, you've been reading some financial books lately. I don't know if you want to get into yeah. some of the key books yeah. you've been reading that have helped shape you. So in my, like recently I've read, uh, the only investment guide you'll need. And I started uh, Tony Robbins Unshakable. I've read in the past Dave Ramsey's The Total Money Makeover. And Dave Ramsey is great too. I like a lot of his stuff. And I've also read Rich Dad Poor Dad. And, and I've never been like, my main focus has never been money in regards to self-development. But as when I became a YouTuber, it started being very important because if you don't manage your money well, then you're not gonna be able to be a YouTuber for long. And if you need to get another job, you're gonna have less time to make videos. So that pretty much got me to focus more on the money side. And I think one of the biggest revelations I've learned came from the idea of consciously figuring out what you're doing and what you're buying because if you're in a situation where you're an autopilot and I feel like I was in this situation, I don't know if Ryan was, he can speak to that. But when I was in university, when I had money in the bank account, I would right away want to see how I can spend it. I was never like, Oh, I'm going to stack this up. I was like, oh, okay, now I have this, I got a scholarship. How can I spend it? I bought purchased a lot of stuff that I didn't really need. And, Eventually, I realized that, hey, I could have been investing that kind of money, whether it's in uh, S&P 500 ETF, which is where if you want to go to um, Wealth Simple Trade, which is the app I use, or Quest Trade, or see a financial advisor, um, you could put your money there, S&P 500 ETF. It usually grows like around 10% a year, or you can figure out stocks. Like I've been really into stocks lately and you can make money, especially now during this period of time. And if you're in it for long term, cause you know, we're young. And if you're young, you have a big advantage, but like investing in something like Amazon, like, you know, in 10 years from now, that's going to be worth a lot more than when you put into it for stocks and stuff like that. So I just realized how much money I spent and I never thought about, Hey, this could be used to create uh, more wealth. And then all of a sudden you'll get passive income streams from uh, let's say if you start investing in dividend stocks or taking out money, then all of a sudden you get into a situation and dividend stocks, by the way, if you don't know, are stocks that pay shareholders a certain percentage of the money that they put in a year. And per stock, you get a certain amount of money. And TD Bank right now because of the opportunity financial stock market um, is have a dividend of like almost 6% right now. So whatever you put in, they'll be paying 6% of that a year. And then um, they also lift their dividends so you can make more money off of it. Plus that's not counting how much the stock grows itself. And you should always know that dividends can be cut if the company needs to. But if you do your research, you can usually find uh, companies that are unlikely to cut their dividends. So knowing stuff like that, and obviously you could uh, Google, you know, dividends, you can Google uh, ETFs, you can Google investing and learn more about it like I did. But knowing that you could put your money somewhere where it'll grow and eventually you'll be able to just which I'm not there yet, but it's like a process. 
And eventually, just off of dividends, if you want to be a dividend investor, you could get your monthly salary. That's all you need to live while your money grows. And as the, um, as the stocks go up in price, right? So it's really cool. And the biggest reason I want to like kind of talk about this wealth stuff is because I think a lot of people, when they assume what's wealth, they picture, you know, uh, someone with huge tons of money and let's say a Ferrari and a mansion and stuff like that. But it's more interesting to talk about what's what you value. And this will come to like a lot of philosophy, whether you want to value appearances, because a lot of those people might be in debt because of all the stuff they got and they have to work jobs they don't like to pay that off. Or do you value your time? And once you save money, you invest money, you create enough passive income, which takes time. You know, you don't do it overnight, but the more passive income you create, the more time you have to do stuff you enjoy. And then you could start that business you love. For example, if, if you're getting half of your payments in passive income from investments, and that now you're starting your own business, your business needs to make a lot less for you to live off of. So that could hold you through those initial phases where, you know, your business is not uh, right away making enough money to live off of. So that to me, I think is, was the big shift seeing that you could actually create passive income by investing money. And then I bought with that, the most important thing, which is freedom to do whatever I want, spend it with who I want, work on uh, satisfying meaningful work that I like to like, on, on uh, philosophy and motion and on anime uproar. So that kind of stuff is, I think, huge. And you also have situations where people don't know that most rich people don't work for time. They, they don't transfer uh, money. They don't uh, exchange time for money. Rather, they find ways, whether it's selling a product uh, even YouTube to an extent is a good scenario because if all things go well, you know, YouTube is super unpredictable, but if all things go well, you could be making money two years after you've published a video. So in that sense, you have, um, you worked for, let's say a week to publish that video, but you're getting some money from it for like two or more years. And of course it's not going to be like as much money as the first day you publish it but it will be something. So if you create enough of those passive streams of income, you can really do whatever you want. And it comes down to, you know, not buying stupid shit. But I've been talking for a while. I can keep going. But yeah, Ryan, what do you think about this stuff? No, it's uh, relatively new to me. And um, I think it's something that's eye-opening how just, you know, 20 years ago, even less, um, business was thought of in such a different way. You had to put in certain hours, show up at say a store that you own and put in, you know, like a 12 hour day, if not more. And now the whole idea of business has shifted. And now there's that emphasis on pass, uh, you know, passive income and the idea that it's not necessarily about how much time you put in, but trying to create good content in whatever sort of field you're in in order to mm. have those people coming back. So yeah, I think that's really interesting. I'm curious, you slightly cut out there. Um, maybe for those who are unfamiliar with the stocks, what would you recommend in terms of percentage that yeah. you have in your bank investing in the stocks? What can you rephrase? So like just what kind of stocks I'm investing in? No, what percentage of that which you have sa saved up would you invest? Yeah, so I'd always say, and again, like I'm not a financial expert, so you know, always do your own research, but I'd always say you need to have, like Dave Ramsey says, an emergency fund. So let's say something, some people say like three months, even like something that could last you for six months or a year, you should keep that on you because you never know when you could need that money. And let's say it's a bad time, like this coronavirus situation. You don't want to have your money um, to have to take your money out of stocks because let's say they dropped. Oh, now you need money because you know you um, 
you're not getting as much work as you used to. Now you're taking it out for way less than the value of the stocks will be in a year, two years, five years, 10 years. So you're losing money if you do that. So always have enough money for at least, I am comfortable with a year. So like having money for a year. But again, when I say a year, I don't mean like something crazy like $50,000. I mean, what I, with my lifestyle, which is not expensive because I purposely uh, would rather save um, money and I don't need like certain luxuries. Um, I'd much rather uh, spend like less. For example, I had buy, bought a used car with, together with my brother. So we did that. So we, we saved a lot of money on that. Um, you know, you don't need to, I don't spend money on clothes. I just buy like Amazon stuff usually and like our anime uproar stuff. Um, so the situation is you just want to be conscious of where you're spending your money because if you're not spending a lot, you can get off. Uh, you could need to save a lot less, but if you're spending 50,000 a year, that means you have to save 50,000 a year before you can invest anything into the stock market. So it all depends on your situation. Um, it depends on, are you in a house that you can't afford and you're like living paycheck to paycheck? How much debt do you have? Because it's probably better, in my opinion, like I'm not in debt. Uh, I picked a university that was close by. Um, so I think that's like a huge advantage. Some people go out of state, out of province, out of like their countries to do university or college. And that can cost huge money and they're paying off that debt for the rest of their lives. And interest is working against you because you're almost can't pay it off as quickly as the interest is growing. So by doing your best to pay off the debt as fast as possible, I prioritize that actually saving that, saving that uh, money for a year or so and then start investing. So this is not me saying, you know, lend money or you haven't paid off your debts or, you know, put all your money in the stock market. Absolutely not. Never. Uh, I think you should to an extent view everything you put in, like, you know, you're okay to lose it. Like if history repeats itself or rhymes and history doesn't, you know, stock market doesn't end forever, the U S economy, then you won't lose it at all. But still, you shouldn't put yourself in a situation where let's say you don't get a paycheck for a month and then you have to right away take out money from the stock market at disadvantageous times where you could have made a lot more money if you just kept it in there. Mm -hmm. I, I really think what you said about students and the amount of debt they could accumulate going to university is super important. Um, I think it's insane. I know how Joe Rogan has even talked about this, how our culture is so backwards in the sense that we expect kids who are literally 17, 18 years old to be cognizant enough to invest up to more than a hundred thousand dollars in debt at such a young age and doing so, uh, pursuing something that they don't even know for sure they may even like or may even bring them any sort of financial freedom in the future. So it's just crazy how at such a young age, you know, people are putting down, you know, almost like a small house in a way, depending on what program you're going into and where For you're sure. traveling, if you're going to study overseas. And I think there, crazy. there really needs to be, um, you know, more of a mindful awareness at that age that, yeah, like we need to think long term because I know so often you get in the heat of the moment and you're thinking, oh, everyone's going to university and they're, they're leaving home and they're, you know, studying abroad and I should do that too. And yeah, you do gain valuable experience, but at the same time, you think about how this will affect your future and it will have a very negative effect in your future in the sense that you'll be more limited in what you could do because you'll be more worried about taking safe options in the future to pay off your debt rather than having that flexibility to take on uh, mm -hmm. different paths that you wouldn't have done if you were saddled with $200,000 worth of debt, which is like, especially in the United States, I've been reading stuff like Excellent Sheep we talked about on the show, which talks about, yeah, a lot of people in the United States, especially 
the average person over like $200,000 in American dollars in debt, which is crazy trying to, you know, in your mid twenties, trying to kind of navigate the world with that on your back. So I definitely yeah. think there needs to be more financial literacy at that young age. No, you're 100% right. Cause people are doing what everyone else is doing and it's mm-hmm. normal, right? But normal, I, in my opinion, is not good right now. And we're in a situation where if you get into debt now, making decisions that you haven't fully thought through at a young age, like there were times when I'm like, oh man, you know, it would have been cool to like go somewhere else for university. But looking back, I'm so glad I didn't because the Seneca even talks about the idea of wherever you go, there you are, just because you go travel to a new place, you're going to bring yourself with you. So the situation is that, yes, you want to get to the point where if you want to like to travel, you can travel, but I don't think you should ever, um, you should ever take debt out, you know, to take loans. So you could just travel to another school or travel in general. Uh, You want to get to the point where you're happy wherever, right? You're happy with yourself. And until you figure that out, then even if you travel, it's not going to make you happy. So I think the real uh, priority, at least in my situation and how I view it, is you know work on yourself. Get to the point where you're happy, no matter you know where you are, and get to the point where you have a certain amount of financial freedom. And then think about like if you want to travel with some extra money you have, but don't don't make a decision where. I believe, I don't know if it's like that in Canada, but in America, it definitely is where you can't get away from that student loan debt. Literally, you have a situation where even if you go bankrupt, you'll still have to pay that off. So you can't escape it, which is scary because now you're not, you're not living for you anymore. You're living to like pay off those debts. And yeah, it limits what you could do. Maybe you're in a job you don't like, but you don't have a choice. Maybe you can't step back and get out of the rat race because if you do that for even a week, you're going to, you're going to keep increasing those debts and you're not going to be able to uh, make ends meet. So definitely, I think that's a huge issue that, that um, is not addressed and that should not even be kind of, I don't know. I, I think people need to, look back. And for example, me, I don't know, Ryan can talk about his experience, but for me, I can promise you, I do not regret not going somewhere else. And I'm super thankful that I got, I didn't go into debt to do university. Yeah. And no, I'm in a similar boat. So myself, I decided to go to university at uh, the school that was really just a city away from mine. So I could stay at home And I mean, there was still tuition, obviously, but it would have um, more than doubled if I decided to stay, um, go away somewhere, especially depending on the city I'm in. I know especially something else to look into as well is um, I know a lot of graduate programs are super expensive. So I think it's important to, if you're interested in graduate school, to look at the different options that are out there that um, you could possibly get paid to do graduate work. I know when I was in university, the professors told me like, that should be the number one priority that you shouldn't really be paying to go to graduate school because universities are there to pay for their graduate students. They're the priority. Exactly. So I think it's important that if you are someone who did an undergrad and wants to pursue graduate work, that you're keeping that in mind that if you're going somewhere and you notice there's an institution that's like, it seems like they're overcharging you even more than undergrads to stay away because really you should be looking at opportunities to, um, to be gaining money when you're in graduate school because you are technically kind of working for the university. So I think there are a lot of interesting strategies that you should know if you're an undergrad looking to go on to more school that you don't necessarily have to accumulate debt to go on to further graduate school. But um, yeah, you, you just want to be more aware and conscious. Just don't throw your money at things because it looks fashionable to do so. Yeah. And I think that's the main thing. Like always be aware of where you're spending your money. Um, again, I think there's a shift and I think Ryan, which I'll let him talk about this in a second. I think he's 
naturally was better at this. But for me, I just didn't think about alternatives. I didn't know like, oh, hey, rather than spending the money, rather than, um, you know, spending the money when I get it, I, I can actually save it and create passive income and eventually get to a point, which again, I'm working towards it, where um, the passive income is enough to just like live off of without even having to do work. And then you could retire if you wanted to. But of course, I don't want to retire because I'm doing something I like. But that's the idea. If you're doing something you don't like right now, think about it. If you save enough passive, if you get enough passive income through investments, um, then you can be in a situation where you're free to pursue whatever you want, whether that's talking about self-development like us, talk about anime like me, or, um, you know, if whether it's uh, starting a, something about something you like, which uh, Gary Vee always talks about, like creating a business off of Smurfs and making 40000 a year, and that that's better than doing something you hate for 200000 a year, right? Because this is the thing. It's all about the journey, in my opinion. And like the destination is death. You know, we all reach the same destination. So we want to enjoy the journey. And there's no point in getting to the end if you don't like the process, right? So you should always try um, to get yourself into a situation where, yes, set goals, do that. That's cool. But you want to, as soon as you can, get to a situation where you're enjoying the process, enjoying every day. Um, rather than waking up every day, hating what you do, not liking what you do, but having to do it because you need to pay off debt, because you don't know there's another way, because you spend money as soon as you get it, right? Um, Dave Ramsey talks about listing everything you spend. And you could do this if you just, let's say, pay with debit card. You can look at your transactions. And just even if a less extreme version is just looking back every month at what you spent money on and being like, Oh, I ate out way too much. I remember even before um, this happened, the uh, lockdown situation, I was going for like coffee usually every day and usually like sometimes multiple coffees, whether it's talking to friends or doing work. I like writing at like Starbucks or whatever. And I mean, is it a huge deal if you know, I'm making enough money? No, it's not a huge deal. But let's say it adds up to 60 to 100 bucks a month. Um, that invested could have gone a long way in like 20, 30, 40 years, what that's worth. It's a lot more than 60 bucks, right? So it all depends. And yeah, it also trains you to be patient. Um, we're, we can bring minimalism into it, which I think is all about instead of wanting to kind of, you have an urge to buy something and trying to fill a hole inside yourself by just, you know, going after that consumeristic thing to just be like okay how can i be happy without purchasing stuff and then when i do purchase stuff i know it's conscious and it's not me trying to get happy and buying a forty-five thousand dollar car and then being happy for a week and then being like okay well now this is the new normal and i'm down forty-five thousand bucks so i have to work a job that you know i don't like so i think that's something that's been a big shift for me, just considering the potential of the money you're spending and what it could mean for your future life, your future freedom, your future happiness, um, rather than just trying to spend it as soon as I get it. I remember in the past, like, let's say I got some money, I'd buy a laptop because I thought it was cool. And I already had a working laptop, so it wasn't completely, uh, completely necessary. And I didn't even have... Um, I wasn't in like a super good situation financially, so I shouldn't have even been buying it, buying it, but I was like, oh, well, this is really cool. I'm going to buy it. No, like there's no point in doing that now, unless I have to buy like, you know, for the, for the business, if I have to buy like a new computer or laptop, the old one's broken, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to do it just to upgrade before I need to, because that's unnecessary. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Ryan, talk about your journey a bit from... Like when you were young, were you always a money saver naturally or how was your experience? Um, I, I was, but that was basically not by choice. I um, was not kind of, uh, I'd never used my debit card throughout high school. 
which was interesting because uh, you told me that and I was like mind blowing just yeah. like that was one of the moments I'm like that's possible like yeah. you could <laughs> I did. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. that was really interesting. So I didn't start until university, but I found the big thing that really got me in university when I started, um, you know, spending more was just uh, spending so much on food, particularly when you're on campus. And, you know, rather than, I think something I've learned in this experience is the importance of uh, cooking and buying food in like bulk from the grocery store. And then being able to cook stuff and it could last you for a couple of days. And even um, during this time, I know the Stokes were big on, you know, minimalist eating. Exactly. And thinking about like, do I need to purchase all these snacks to get me through the day? No, right. You really think about um, how you're able to survive on less and how that's actually a lot of times more healthy for you. It really depends on what you're putting into your body, obviously, when you are, but you could definitely get by without snacking and by cooking in bulks, you know, whether it be chicken or rice. And that could last you a couple of days. So when I was in university, that was something that really I wasn't good at. I was spending basically food every Same, day. bro. And, um, you know, especially now, if you go on to, I don't want to keep talking about campus life, but uh, it's interesting. No, like, I mean, it's a big part of our life, right? We, yes. It's um, like university. It, um, I was on campus maybe last year for something. I mean, I, I am as well. I have worked part-time at uh, college, teaching college courses. So I've seen campus life there. And right now, I mean, kids are spending up to $15 for a simple meal. So that goes a long way when you're thinking about your eating every day. So and maybe multiple times a day too. Exactly. So I think that being more mindful with how you spend food, how I spend food was really important. And even now that we've talked about over the past while, things like fasting, whether it be intermittent fasting or full out fasting for up, throughout the entire day, you know, there are some great health benefits, psychological benefits, but there's great financial benefits as well because you're able to not have to spend money or not have to worry about food during that time. You have to be responsible, of course, when you're doing it, but um, to make sure you're still getting your nutrients. But I think, yeah, reframing and being more mindful about how much you spend on food really helped me. Um, I know something that I haven't necessarily have done, but I really want to do, you talked about it in Ramsey's book, is kind of listing out your finances because I feel by doing that, that really makes what uh, you spend more mindful. And I feel there's yeah, times definitely. that I push it to the unconscious a bit. Um, but now that I've been home more, I've really been able to reflect and look at some of my finances. And I know you've been the same way because I've even told you about, there are some things that during this time I've been going through, subscriptions that I didn't even know I was subscribing to and uh -huh. sure they may have been like five, ten dollars a month, but then I'm like, oh my goodness, I thought I I canceled that like a year ago. And I wasn't even mindful that because it was so little that this was still charging me. And after a while, it adds up after a year, after oh, two definitely. Years. So, you know, there's yeah. times where just yeah, being more mindful about looking at your statements, I think is important and writing it out is a huge conscious step to do that because it's right mm -hmm. in front of you and you're you know physically making it come to life yeah sorry i don't know i don't know if i black out for you but like my computer is uh turning off a bit but hopefully i'll no, just keep touching that. the mouse a bit all right cool um yeah so pretty much i also noticed that i was like spending a lot of like monthly expenses the subscriptions just they add up right mm -hmm. so you know you have you have your spotify you have your disney plus you have your netflix you have your gym membership and they just add up up and then before you know it you're paying like 100 but the dollars a month before you even get started you know mm -hmm. so and ask yourself like when you do this or am i using this do i need all of this um I know I tried to cancel my gym membership and then they're like, Oh, because of the situation, you know, you can't cancel until you come in when things are handled or whatever, which I was like, Oh, that's unfortunate. But gym memberships are huge. I, I hopefully my brother won't mind me saying this, but 
because he exercises in different ways. Like he has a he has a bike and stuff like that, indoor bike. But like he has a gym membership for like two years, and he's like gone once, <laughs> like, yeah. and he's paying that that monthly thing. And it's like it's they make it such a hassle to just cancel a gym membership that you have to like come in and you have to do all this work. And then sometimes they don't even let you if like, you know, they're not open, you can't do it online. So it's a situation where, you know, you, you start to be like, okay, whatever, you know, you're focusing on different stuff, but you should, you should like see what you're using oftentimes. And I'm not saying to uh, cancel your Netflix or whatever, but oftentimes even if you just tried for a month or something, if you cancel your subscriptions, cause you know, we can spend on subscriptions uh, like Netflix, um, Disney plus uh, video games, like we can spend money and time on it all month, right? We can spend uh, every hour that we're not working. We could find in today's day and age with the internet stuff to amuse ourselves with. And maybe it's not stuff that will necessarily be the most beneficial. So if you just cut out, like let's say Netflix, all of a sudden that's not an option. You might find that you start working on that business. So you start working on that book or you start doing something that you never did because all of a sudden you know, you're kind of bored and you're like, Hey, now this will be more interesting than doing nothing. And I always want to do it. So in a way I've used that to kind of force myself to do work sometimes but right now, currently, I do watch um, Netflix, so I'm putting that out there. But in the past, sometimes I just cancel distractions, right? Because that could be distractions, and just work on my business and just work on developing myself, reading all the books I bought and never read instead of buying a new book, right? Because it's so easy, and I love Amazon. I think like they, you know, in a lot of ways, change the world for the better, but like they make it so easy for you to buy things like a one click mm. to buy to buy things and it's all of a sudden you don't even think about it like dave ramsey talks about how when you give someone money it's very real you're like i'm losing this money but when you click one button to purchase like let's say a book a camera something like that you you don't feel it. You don't feel like you spent anything. And it's a lot easier to keep going. It's not like looking at that money, like giving it to someone and knowing, okay, I I have less money now. So it's just, yeah, bringing mindfulness to it. Ask yourself, do I need all of this? Maybe if you have Disney Plus, uh, if you have uh, HBO, if you have Netflix, ask yourself, which one am I watching the most? And just stick with that one and try without the other ones. So that's the thing. Cause if you do constantly spend money on this stuff, it will eventually get to the point where you need to work to just maintain this style of life that you're doing. Let's say going out to eat every day, stuff like that. And then you won't be in a position where you have the freedom to do what you want to do. If you want to start your own business, if you want to have more free time uh, with your family, with your friends, you know, like, financial freedom like again i don't think money is the key to happiness but being able to do what you love every day goes a long way towards creating a happy life and how can you do that by saving investing and eventually having a passive income where you could pretty much sleep and make money and then um, do whatever you want every day right and you think you're going to be lazy and you're not going to be wanting to do anything and perhaps there are some people like that, but in my own experience, I don't work any less now that, I, um, that I'm in a better position than I was before. I guess you could say at the beginning, you do work ridiculously hard to get the thing going, but that's not sustainable. And then you find yourself in a situation where it's much easier. You're much more enjoying it when you can come from a place of, I get to do this rather than I have to do this and you will keep working. You like, you know, retirement sounds good to people who haven't experienced it, like haven't spent like months just chilling on a beach, but eventually you'll want to do something. You'll want to create something. You'll want to 
um, share your love of something. You'll want to somehow contribute to society. I, I truly feel that. That's, that's definitely what I feel like. Um, even when I'm in a better position now, I'm not, I'm not taking advantage of that and working less. I'm working, you know, we're sometimes uh, finishing just me, not my brother, three, four videos a week. And we have editors to help us. But, you know, even before when I needed more money, um, I, would, I would publish like two, three videos a week. So it doesn't mean, don't be scared that if you put yourself in a position where you don't need to work, you're going to stop working. No, you're going to actually find something that you really enjoy doing, which I think is much more rewarding. Mm -hmm. I found something that was really eye-opening. I read, I think it was the happiness equation yes. um, that talks about how retirement is a relatively new phenomenon in the sense that it hasn't been around for like hundreds of years. It was really, I think, uh, a factor of one of the either World War One or World War Two. Um, one of the uh, wars that I think it originated in Germany uh, in order to get new people into the job market. But yeah, I think we're fed this idea that we work in order to be able to retire eventually. But like you said, it takes the joy out of what you're doing if you're only doing something because you're working towards, you know, and it's not even really financial freedom when you retire because you only get a certain portion of it. But um, I think that, yeah, we, we need to really look at the narratives that were, that were fed at a young age about just trying to find something for the sake of it being a, a way for us to, to retire. So I totally agree with that idea of rethinking um, what brings us joy. And yeah, it links so much to minimalism as well. Because in minimalism, we're also thinking about that as well. What brings us joy in life and things like essentialism, what brings us joy every day and cutting out what doesn't. So for sure, I think you could definitely marry the two. Um, yeah. No, and I wanted to say like with that book, you mentioned Happiness Equation. I'm pretty sure it says it in that book and in Ikigai, which is another book I'd recommend that the happiest uh, people that are, you know, older and live the longest are people who have projects that they're working on. They have things, they have work, right? Whether sometimes they get paid for it or they're just giving a service to others. That is a common thing you'll find among happy, healthy, long living people that they're doing that. Um, it's a myth that like, you know, we'll enjoy doing nothing all day when we eventually retire. No, you're going to want to, fill your time with meaningful stuff and oftentimes you get into a situation where you know you worked you worked your whole life working a job you didn't like to retire and then you're as they sometimes say too old to even enjoy the money you have and also a lot of people suffer through depression they uh they don't uh enjoy their retirement as much as they think they did so I would strongly ask anyone who's kind of just waiting to enjoy life until retirement that you should reconsider that because a lot of people find that it's not as fulfilling as they think when they're working all the time. And, and so if you're trading like your whole life for 10, 15, if you're lucky, 20 years of being able to do what you want, realize that you don't have to, it doesn't have to be an either or you can, uh, if you're just willing to make some financial sacrifice in the short term, then you're able to invest. You're able to build wealth, have money working for you rather than against you, which is what that is. Compound interest works for you. And then at this age, you don't need to wait that long. You can be at in your twenties, thirties, um, even forties, it's still much better than waiting till you're 65 to be able to do whatever you want to do. So yeah, don't buy into that myth that you have to spend your whole life doing something you don't like so you can enjoy a few years when you're 65. Mm -hmm. And I know even Seneca says that we shouldn't do that because we're not guaranteed time in the future, right? Our lives could end at any point that if we're always just living exactly. for the future instead of the present, um, we don't 
have that um, option. Like we don't have control over that. We only have control and, over the now. Yeah. And Seneca says, and I don't necessarily agree with this, but Seneca says like, you know, um, our youth is our best time. So like, let's say twenties, thirties, and then life gets more and more difficult. Like as you, um, it's less sweet, I guess is what he says. Um, when you get older and that idea is the idea is don't wait, don't put it off living. Right. Um, Seneca, a lot of others, I'm sure you can always find happiness. That's what stoicism is all about too. It's about, you can always live virtuously, even when you have more challenges, but definitely you want to enjoy your youth. You want to enjoy your twenties, thirties, you know, you don't want to just wait until you have so much, um, so much little life left to actually start living. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Before maybe we go, do you have any more recommendations for financial uh, literacy books or financial strategies? Um, yeah, I just say like, again, um, I'm kind of relatively new to this myself since I became a YouTuber, I was more conscious of it. Um, but I'd say if you want to kind of like create that, um, you know, it's good. We're the average of the five people we spend the most time with. Right. And one of those people can be like someone you watch on YouTube. And for example, Dave Ramsey, watching someone like that could reinforce in your mind not to make stupid purchases when, and all of a sudden when you're watching that content, it becomes much easier for you to actually put it into practice because if you don't, everyone around you is going to be like, Oh, it's time for you to get a house. It's time for you to get a new car. You know, don't you, don't you want a better car than this person? Or don't you want, you don't want other people to think, you know, certain things if you don't have your own house already, or if you don't have a car, just, it becomes a lot easier to ignore all that noise when you know there are people out there and communities out there who are putting their, uh, happiness, freedom, um, first rather than just buying everything they can you know falling into that consumerist trap where you can end up working a job you don't like for the rest of your life mm -hmm. for sure being more mindful and hopefully this period of time one of the benefits will be bringing more mindfulness towards our spending and towards what we've saved in the past and how to save better in the future because that's one of the big crisis that's going on right now. It's not just, you know, a crisis like a physical crisis when it has to do with mm -hmm. the virus. It's also like an existential crisis as well, like making us rethink how we lived before. And I think that is hopefully something positive that we could learn and take away from this time is how to live better going forward. Yes, and that's definitely, um, in my opinion, the case for sure. Yeah. For sure. All right. Well, everyone, we appreciate you listening to this conversation. And I know myself, Igor and I were talking about possibly reinvigorating one of the book clubs we were having before when we first. Yeah, I mean, it's a good time for sure. Because everyone is uh, at home and um, has access to books in some way, whether it be online or maybe books you have around. So if you actually have any ideas for any books, you could definitely leave a comment for us and we'll see if we have it but if not we'll probably um, announce soon uh, a book that uh, we're going to be starting that we'll devote a whole episode to and um, yeah we're really excited about that and uh, we're really excited to continue to use this time productively hopefully and grow as people because we're looking at it as an opportunity for growth not an opportunity wasted Exactly. And there's always opportunity, no matter what the situation is. And yeah, even though, you know, the stock market is down now, a lot of people are taking advantage of that to actually make money in the long run. Obviously, it might go down even more, the stock market, but eventually, you know, unless it's uh, the end of the world, the end of the American economy, it will, just as it has for over hundreds of years, go back up. So yeah, that's, that's the situation. And I'm super excited for the book club. I think it's a good time to do it. And I recommend it if you want to save money, um, 
you will in the long run save money by like buying Kindle eBooks. Or if you uh, just want to come get the gist of the books, uh, you can come listen to us if you uh, don't want to spend money on it too. So it's definitely, we're not trying to add more expenses to you, but I do think uh, books are one of the most undervalued things ever. And the fact that you can get life-changing advice, sometimes on Kindle for free, if there are older books, or sometimes for like a dollar, nine dollars, um, you can get advice that changes your life. So that books, I think, are one of the most undervalued uh, investments you can make. For sure. And I know a cheap alternative, if your mind's able to work this way, I have a bit of trouble. But if your um, mind works well at listening to audiobooks, audiobooks are also a great investment uh, instead of the physical copy because you could get away with only spending less than $10 a month and getting whatever book you'd like, including books that are over $30 or $40. So if you're able to uh, do that, I know that's something I struggle with. I can't really um, follow along with audiobooks and multitask, like the way I'm able to listen to podcasts and multitask. I need the, the book in front of me, but there are so many different options out there nowadays, which makes it a lot cheaper than it was before that you should for sure check out. Definitely. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, let us know if you have any of your suggestions for, you know, how to save money, how to stay in the right mind frame. Um, just let us know in the comments. Uh, stay saving, stay safe, and we'll see you next time.